very happy to have a chance to bring this talk uh, to the community of ACT. And today's topic is, is deep dive into deep learning. So before the presentation, I would like to clarify that the learning here is not the learning theory in education. It's the learning, machine learning in computer science. So we often hear a lot of things like uh, artificial intelligence is the future, or machine learning can do everything, or deep learning is winning on face recognition, something like that. It seems that those words are uh, interchangeable, but actually they are not. We say artificial intelligence is the most broader, wider area, and uh, machine learning came later in early, around early like uh, 1980s and it's a way to fulfill artificial intelligence. But deep learning is, uh, is a very new thing. It starts from 2010, and it wins everywhere, so it's the best algorithm for machine learning, something like that. Talk about artificial intelligence. It all started in the summer of 1955. Several big guys, big names in computer science, including the inventor of the information theory, Shannon, Professor Shannon, they organized a workshop to discuss the ideas in the field of in the field of thinking machine. Joe Mitchell named it artificial intelligence in this way, and he think uh, the machine can think and it's artificial, so we should call it artificial intelligence. They discuss a lot of topics like um, computers natural language processing, neural networks, even measured by today's perspective, they are quite advanced. So we have started to imagine the bright future of AI. So we are dreaming that we can have a machine like Terminator, or at least this 3 po But we, try, we, we tried a lot, but it turns out we cannot reach that. What we have invented is, not, is far away from even a rat or a beetle. So we lower the bar. We try a smaller target. We call it narrow AI. That is, we, we are trying to invent a lot of technologies that can perform specific tasks, like uh, classified images on some websites to do facial recognition to recognize person, or um, try to uh, recognize some keywords from a speech, something like that. But how can we do it? We are doing it by so-called machine learning. So what is machine learning? So a machine learning approach to achieve artificial intelligence, basically narrow AI. So instead of we set up a lot of rules and follow those rules to do things, we are using data and algorithms so basically, we are making assumptions about the data and uh, models, that is function. So we use algorithm to predict the models, parameters from, for those functions. Uh, basically, the target is we're trying to make decisions about something. For example, classification, clustering, and the problem can be, uh, the problems can be uh, uh, categorized to supervised, unsupervised, depending on whether or not we have labels for the data, or semi-supervised, if we have very limited label for the data. And we have invented a lot of models like decision trees, neural networks, SVN, base networks, a whole bunch of stuff. But uh, before 2010, we observed that for even for narrow AI, a lot of applications, those methods can only achieve very limited outcomes. So the effort in early machine learning looks like this. So at first, we have some signals from different modalities, such as image, speech, or NLP text, uh, for, for uh, or the text information. So we, at first, design some uh, fixed human corrupted feature to process those signals, and then use some uh, unsupervised tool, for example, k-means or pooling or mixture of Gaussians to, protest, 
to process those features we extracted. So the core idea, the core step, is to de develop some good features from different signals. For example, for vision, we use SIFT or HOG. Um, it's uh, actually a histogram of gradients. It's basically, uh, we make a histogram of the edges in the image, but the parameters like how many beams, which, which kind of uh, uh, other parameters we should use, should be well defined by human. But there are some problems. We cannot define one good uh, human crafted feature in one domain and use it in another domain directory because they are different. Because every day we are finding new signals, we are finding new hardware to process and get a new feature. So this is not critical. Especially you, if you take a look at uh, this image about a living room and if you can get a, a corresponding kinect depth information, you cannot just use the image features directly. And another drawback is that those features, if we uh, use human crafted um, vessel to process them, we found out the computation time is very demanding. So what are ideal features? The best thing we can imagine that is we can extract objects from the image directly. For example, from this image, we can get like windows, chair, monitor, something like that directly. Another, um, another good wish is that can we uh, design some method or algorithm can extract the feature automatically. That is, we do the modeling, we fulfill the task, perform the task, and at the same time, we can learn good features from the data we indicate. Researchers have tried a lot. Basically, they are going two directions. The first one is they are trying to use a combination of very simple functions, for example, linear combinations. The second one is they are trying to stack the small functions or nonlinear modules, layer by layer by layer. And uh, they believe that and they have proved that by using the composition of different small functions they can simulate any function in the nature. And the practice of deep learning um, prove that the second one is the best. But why? So let's take this example, uh, the object recognition as an example. Uh, if, we, if we are going to uh, <coughs> predict uh, the glass label of those objects, say we have 1,000 class labels. We can use uh, combinations of different templates of these objects. But if we met unfamiliar object, for example here is a big truck. It hasn't been seen by the model. We have to add another template to the model to predict it. So this is not critical because we don't want to do this. But for deeper structure, we don't have to do this even though we haven't seen the big truck. But we have seen the some low-level features of the big truck, for example, the edges, the corners. We have seen that in some in small cars, uh, even a bicycle, something like that. We also seen some like middle-level, high-level abstract parts already. Uh, for example, the window, the wheels, we've seen that. So if we can train a model to learn low-level features, and middle level features, and we can reuse it, and we can compute it in a distributed way. So in that way, we can save a lot of computation, and the model will be much more sim simpler. The biological inspiration, if we come back to see the structure of brain, we see that the visual cortex is hierarchical, it's layered, and the brain uses billions of slow and processor we call ne neurons. They act in parallel. And there are thousands of in uh, collections incoming, and they also output signals to the next layer to process the information. So 
researchers have made some abstraction to simulate the act of this kind of neuron. That is, for example, if we have um, uh, a vector of input, we, those elements of the vector uh, multiply, multiply, multiply by uh, corresponding weights and sum them up. We input the number into a nonlinear function, which is, which is called activation function, and out, output to next level. So this function is quite simple. It's basically a linear processing plus a non, very simple nonlinear function. So the nonlinear function is used to regularize or normalize the, uh, the computed number into some range, for example, from 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1. Uh, the practice shows the rectified linear or this one. That is, uh, for a uh, signal less than, zero, uh, less than 0, just put it to be 0. And uh, the rest is just linear. But this nonlinear function is the best uh, in the practice. So we are talking about neurons, but um, in actual computation, we use layer networks. That is, there are a lot of layers. Each layer contains of a lot of neurons, and they get information from the last layer and outputs to the next layer. And we can um, make abstraction to show this, that is, the input is x, and after one module, it's the, the first module is the first layer, and we can process, process this um, for one level, the second level, and afterwards we get output. What we want to do is we are trying to fit the output to the desired ground truth of our data. So what do we do? We measure the loss between the output and the ground truth and try to adjust the weights in the system. We have to compute a lot of uh, partial uh, derivatives and uh, pass back those arrows back to the system by using the chain rule, which is called back propagation here. But we cannot do this over the whole data set because the data is so big, for example, millions of data. So we divide this big data into small batches, which is called mini batch, and we select them randomly. And each time we input the mini batch to the system and to do the optimization. This is called stochastic random, uh, st stochastic uh, gradient descent. So now we have an abstraction uh, idea of what is deep learning. So we have some inputs and we will process them one layer by one layer by one layer and get output directly. So this is an end-to-end -end system. We don't have to design the feature. And um, because in each layer we have, we have used neurons for computing, that is each neuron is very simple. Uh, the computation is very simple. So we can use very simple computation unit such as graphics processing unit to compute it. Go back to the first slide, we take a look at the timeline, and all of a sudden, in around, uh, around 2010, in different sub-areas of machine learning, deep learning model is, uh, are winning. For example, uh, like handwriting recognition, OCR, uh, traffic sign recognition, pedestrian detection, and also speech recognition. And this list, this is keep growing. Now I'm going to introduce the family of deep learning. So it's quite big. Here I'm only introduce some uh, models are very successful here. The first one is called convolutional neural networks. The second one is recurrent neural network. By the name, you will see this is related to temporal information. And also <coughs> the deep reinforcement learning, which is widely used in for example, robotics, self-driving, and at the last, generative adversarial networks used for uh, generating data. The first one, 
the first one, application applications of convolutional neural network. So the most of CNN based models are about sensing what, where, and when from different modalities. For example, from images, we, we can detect where are the objects and what are the objects. And for the medical image analysis, we can see uh, is there a cancer or where is the target area. And for speech recognition, uh, we are trying to find uh, what, what is the text information for this speech and does it contain a music, something like that. We can imagine some like applications in education. For example, we can detect uh, where are the faces uh, of students and teachers and what kind of devices they are using. Uh, is, is there a good engagement between the teachers and uh, students or between the devices and students. Or we can track uh, the gesture of the students in the classroom to see whether he followed the right movement. Or we can decide the emotion of a little child in a test to see whether this test is too hard for him. Uh, this is something I have done uh, in the past for uh, testing center uh, biometrics. That is because in a lot of test centers, cheating happens. So to avoid this, we're trying to see whether this guy is the real guy in the test center. We use his ID, we compare his ID and the picture when he entered the test center to see whether they are the same guy. By the way, this is my manager, Saad, and uh, I selected some pictures uh, of him uh, in history from uh, college to now and compared, compared to uh, the, the, the face in the ID. And the numbers here shows uh, the similarity between these images. And we can see the second one, which is not him, got the lowest value. So, we have uh, used our system based on deep learning, actually CNN, uh, on a tester data set. And our, our algorithm outperformed the third party face recognition engine uh, by some margin, a big margin. <coughs> Here, the name is convolutional neural networks. So what is convolution? So at first, take an image as an example. Uh, if we use convolution, at first convolution should come with the kernel. For example, uh, on the right top, if we use a 3x3 three three kernel on an image, the 3x3 three three kernel is like this. We have to multiply any element, all, all the elements to the corresponding element in the image and sum them up so to get a result. If, if you observe carefully, you, you will find actually this kernel perform an operation to get the vertical edges of the image. But this is only for edge detection. Different kernels can produce different results, what we call feature map. And those kernels could be two dimension like this. It also could be three dimension. Then we can apply like this. We can scan the whole feature map. And we can generate different feature map in the left level. Another important idea is pooling. Because we are processing very large image, for example, 1,000 by 1,000. We have to extract features from them. There are, lot, there are a lot of data, in, even in one image. So we have to shrink the feature map a little by little. So how can we do that? After we compute uh, the compute by convolution, we get some results. And from those results, we get a maximum one to represent the most important signal 
For example, for an area, we know the most important signal should be an eye. We are trying to detect an eye. And the, the, the signal feedback of, of, of the eye will come out, become the maximum signal here. So the actual CNN system will uh, iterate between uh, convolutional level and coding level, and at last get the final results. There are some famous models in history. The first one is VGG model, uh, which has come from the Vision Geometry Group of Oxford University. And the second one uh, used widely is called Google Maps, which is invented in 2014. Uh, a model, a module A module called Inception uh, is used in this model. And the last one, also a big breakthrough of CNN, is called the Residual Network, which is invented in 2016. The big feature of this model is that it contains a very deep structure, for example, one handbook. There are some jumps between the slides. So now we are going to introduce the recurrent neural network. So the recurrent neural network uh, take sequence as input and trying to output either a single value or also a sequence. For example, it can be used for the competition of a sentence. You give a sentence to uh, the first part of, uh, uh, if we extract one word from the same meaning. Yeah. Should I continue? No, just watch. You are. For example, we can use it for sentence completion. If we only extract one word from the sentence, we can predict what is the word. And we can use it for sequence to sequence uh, language translation because we are input a paragraph and trying to get the paragraph of another language. It can also be used for, for example, to predict uh, uh, the stock of the next time the rise were done. So this is the uh, model of the recurrent network. It contains three parts. The input X, which is the input signal. Uh, H is the hidden state. And O is the output. And if we unfold this model, we can see it's, it's like, a, for example, Markov chain here, because each hidden status, hidden state, only depend on the hidden state of the last time. So here we can see uh, the hidden state is actually a function of the hidden state of last time and the current input. And the current output is only depending on the current hidden state. The model we just introduced is the vanilla model of uh, recurrent network. It contains a lot of problems. One big problem is that we have introduced that to optimize the model, we have to use back propagation, try to compute gradients uh, from one layer to next layer to the deep sea layer. But the problem is because this is sequence model, uh, it will like, uh, it contains a lot of uh, steps. For example, if the paragraph is very long, uh, for example, 100 words, it will go around for 100 times. What if somehow the gradient is bigger than one? That means we will involve a lot of uh, mod mod uh, modification of the gradients. So this will cause the expulsion of the gradients. Or if the gradient is smaller 
the one, and after some steps, those gradients will vanish. So how can we do that to improve this? So for the uh, the first problem, we are trying we are using a technique which is called gradient clipping, try to normalize it. And for the second one, we have invented two uh, new models. The first one is called long short memory. Another one is called gated recurrent unit. Can solve this problem a little bit. Another problem is although uh, some model, for example, long short memory should be able to deal with the memory problem. That is, we should memorize uh, something happened before for some application, for, for example, translation. But in practice, long term, long range dependencies are still not very good. So, how can we solve this problem? If you have, uh, if you are interested in this one, you can go to a model called attention model. It's like this. Well, for example, when we do the um, a reading comprehension, after reading, you will go back to see the content in the past to try to find what, what you are interested in or related to the question. So the, the attention model is like this. You will go back to see all outputs in the, in the past and try to evaluate the current output. Deep reinforcement learning. Um, um, bas basically, reinforcement learning is not related to deep learning. Our, but deep, lear deep, deep reinforcement learning is a combination of reinforcement learning and deep learning. Um, reinforcement learning is about an agent interacting with the environment. Each time it has a state, and based on the environment, uh, it should take an action. If we and take an action, and this action is a sequential, uh, you you don't know that uh, the final result if you you are not on the last step. For example, if you are play, playing a chess, you will see this. You don't know whether this movement is right or not till the uh, you actually win or lose that game. So this. Uh, model can be used for a lot of applications such as chess, computer games, self-driving cars, robotics. Uh, the left side are si uh, is simpler. The right side is much much more difficult because uh, for later applications, at first we should choose the domain of features, and also we don't know uh, the environment a lot. It's quite complicated. We are talking about reinforced learning, but how deep learning can be used? It? Because we are trying to find a policy to direct us to take action. So this policy should be learned from the environment. We have a combination of action and state and corresponding reward from the environment. We will, we will record this and feedback to the system and learn it again and again. How to record our knowledge? We use the deep learning, the neural networks to do this. So after learning, when we get a new state and uh, the, the status of the environment, we can predict which is the, what is the next step action we should take. So the last one is called generative adversarial networks. So this one is quite interesting because um, sometimes we don't have a lot of data. How can we create some new data? That's one thing. Another thing is sometimes we don't have very good label data. How can we control the label and generate some data below that label? This model was invented two to three years ago. And the uh, advocator of deep learning, the pro professor Yan Lacan, uh, who is currently the director of machine learning at Facebook, he said this is the most important findings of machine learning in the past 20 years. It's not mature yet, but it's very interesting. So again, generative adversarial network contains two networks actually. One is called discriminator, another one is called generator. Think about you are trying to input some noise into this system, and the generator would follow, <coughs> they take this random noise and produce some some work, for example, for example, a painting. And the discriminator will examine that because 
um, because he is quite uh, new, but uh, he know what is what the real data is. He can give an answer whether this is not uh, the real one or not. He will feedback this information to the generator, and generator will improve his skill and create some more advanced one and get this and turn this to the discriminator. In this way, both the discriminator and the generator, their skills will grow at the same time. At the last, at the last, so this will become balanced. So even when generator creates some something which is very uh, near to the new, to real data, the dis discriminator cannot tell it. So this is the core idea of GAN. Uh, the GAN I just introduced is the is the original form. It can take some additional information such as labels to predict some new data. For example, if you are use the uh, the tax information as the auxiliary input, you can predict, you can produce some new images. For example, if you input red bird, it will really produce some image with the red bird. So in this way, you can generate the data set. And if you are uh, if you are inputting uh, like a road map here, it can produce something like a satellite map from uh, from nowhere. And I have done some work on this part too, um, trying to generate automated interview system. We have some training data, and uh, uh, of uh, of a university interview data. We are trying, for example, if we input the response of the interviewees and uh, the actions of the interview interviewer. So. Imagine that we can make this automatic by using this girl's videos. We can predict. We can get a system that uh, if an interview E is there, uh, she talk, uh, input uh, some text information, he smell, and the interviewer can smell back and see something according. For this part, I did something to produce uh, uh, facial expressions. You see, when we input um, some interviewees expression, for example, joy or anger, we can get a mirroring of these kind of expressions. So the relationship between the input and output is not just mirroring. There are some, but there are some like fixed relationship. For example, uh, for sad, you will see this kind of a, a serious expression all the way. Uh, but for neutral, you will see all different kinds of expressions as output. And this can also be done for multiple people. Uh, this data set is called the main data set used for uh, uh, effective learning. And if you have a different, uh, different interview earth images or videos, you can produce the output response of different interviewees. And those are images created. You can see some defects, for example, on the overhead. But overall, the quality is quite good. And it also produce some mirroring or uh, uh, accordingly some expressions uh, to the input of the interviewer. Uh, open source libraries for deep learning. Um, there are a lot of libraries over there, uh, for example, Ciano, uh, TensorFlow, Torch, Cafe, Cafe2. Here I give two tables. The first table uh, measures uh, some index, for example, uh, which kind of language it supports, or is there enough tutorial or documents uh, supporting this kind of library. And overall, I think TensorFlow is best. And also, on uh, the platform of GitHub, TensorFlow has the most, uh, has the, has the most large, largest projects applying on different machine learning applications. Computational resources. Definitely you can buy a computer, high-end computer, with very decent CPU, RAM, 
GPU, you can do that. For example, you can buy NVIDIA GTX one. I'm, I'm not trying to sell this computer to you because <laughs> I didn't. I just buy, I just bought a gaming computer and buy some GPUs by myself and insert them into my computer to run. But also, you can choose another way. You can use online deep learning platform, for example, AWS, Amazon um, Web Service. They are pre-built deep learning instance you can use. And also you can use Cloud AI at Google. At last, I will uh, introduce some of my thoughts about um, how to use deep learning on AIG, automatic item generation, uh, which aroused, uh, aroused a lot of interest of ACT, <coughs> uh, where if we can do that, we can try to do semi-automatic item generation. That is, for example, from passages, you can generate questions directly. From the math knowledge database, you can try to generate questions like that. How can we do that? Uh, think about we have some information like we have raw text, we have database of items previously used, and we have knowledge structure of all different kinds of uh, domains. How can we use machine learning to perform the following tasks, such as we can select correct content, we can do type identification, which type is this item, and we can at last, to generate, to do the question construction. So I'm trying to divide this problem into two sub-problems. That is, at first, we need to summarize the knowledge source, or try to get a real meaning of that source. For example, we have a very long passage. We're trying to summarize into very important sentences so we can get questions from it. And the second one is how to generate critical questions based on the knowledge we have learned. So the models can be used, uh, I think, at first we can use recurrent networks because it involves a sequence to sequence. <coughs> Think about if we do summarization, we have a very long sequence of text. We are trying to generate a shorter sequence of the knowledge. And it can use perhaps generative adversarial networks. Um, it's quite new. and maybe in the future we can use deep reinforcement learning because sometimes if you design items in a way that each item is a step you can say uh, this item will solve the first part of the problem the second item will solve the further problem so in this way uh, solved item is like uh, play the chess it's like playing a chess so we maybe we can use uh, deep reinforcement learning so here I give some literature about uh, the content, how to model the content. The first one is use uh, the generative adversary networks to model the words in a document. So which words are more important? Which words are more uh, significant uh, correlate to others? The second one is uh, trying to do text summarization is a model by Google Brain. And the last one uh, is a neural attention model from Facebook also to do sentence summarization. Another way to do it, um, uh, there, are the, there are models, uh, sentence, uh, sequ sequence to sequence model is give you a long sequence of the paragraph, for example. You can generate the question directly. And it also involves <coughs> um, uh, the sequence to sequence model and attention model there. there. Uh, at last, uh, if we can generate uh, the answers from, for example, from the passage, very short answers, can we generate the question? Uh, in my imagination, uh, one way we can do is we can design a dialogue system. That is, because in the dialogue system, somebody will ask questions and somebody will answer that questions. How about we already know the answer and get back <coughs> to the questions? So we can try to uh, design some dialogue, try to generate some dialogues, and based on the answers, we can uh, try to output the quest questions based on dialogue models. Here's, at last, I would like to introduce some of the limitations of deep learning models. 
So the biggest problem is that it's like a black box and there's no theory on it. So people sometimes get confused about uh, the whole model. But I should say that when we look back to the history, a lot of con contributions will be invented by engineers at first. And then the theory will come on to explain it or improve it. So I think this is normal. Another thing is uh, it lacks some mechanism for complex reasoning, search, and inference. And this is normal too because uh, deep learning is quite young. It's a baby right now. And it lacks some memory, as I introduced, even though the long short memory in the model can keep some information from the past, but it's not enough. And um, at last, it, it lacks the ability to perform unsupervised learning. Say our human can do this. When we make something, uh, we don't have a lot. We don't need a lot of data to to make a decision. For example, when we take a look at the apple, the first time we when we know this is an apple, we we can memorize it and use it for recognition next time. But machine is not acting like this. So maybe we should uh, think about it and trying to invent some models that can produce data. And again, generative adversary models get a very good uh, and produce some very encouraging results on this. Here are the references um, I, I searched. I found very useful. The first link uh, is actually a full reading list about deep learning. You can take a look. And the second link uh, is different evaluation models of deep learning on uh, GitHub. You can use directly, for example, facial recognition or trying to analyze the satellite image data, something like that. And there are a lot of tutorials also. Uh, personally, I like the, the tutorial from Stanford University. It contains a lot of slides and PDFs you can read. Summary. So deep learning is a very popular <coughs> tool in machine learning and produce almost the best results for all the fields, subfields of machine learning. And um, in those models, uh, CNN, which is supervised uh, deep learning model, pro proven to be the best and most successful because it can sense uh, signals or truths or facts from different modalities. And uh, the third is uh, deep learning has been widely used for, has not been widely used for education, so this is a chance box. And at last, deep learning is far from maturity is lack of theory and lack of mechanism for complex reasoning, uh, such kind of stuff. But um, in this way, we should we should very we should be very careful and look into the research area. What are the new things coming out every year? <coughs> Thanks.